Good morning, everyone. Um, today's lecture is going to be on electromagnetic testing. Before we get started, I just want to follow up from last week's lecture on radiographic techniques and see if anyone had any questions from the lecture or not. So just a, just a brief follow up. We discussed film radiography. We discussed digital radiography. And then we, we discussed three-dimensional computed tomography. Um, in terms of resolution, the 3D computed tomography will give you the best results because it takes a 360 scan with 2D slices uh, throughout. There's about 2,000 to 3,000 slices uh, approximately for the turbine blade sample that I used as a case study. Um, there's some differences between sources of noise, which we discussed on the previous lecture, and then um, uh, the decision to use each technique depends on both the geometry, the longest size dimension um, dictates whether the x-rays will be able to penetrate it or not, and also the cost of the inspection uh, depending on the criticality of the component. So today we're going to discuss eddy current testing um, and just wanted to give you a brief background on the history of eddy current testing. Um, it dates back to 600 BC and Thales of Miletus and it, it dates back to actually just phenomenon found out uh, dealing with handling of materials. So uh, the, the Greek individual was rubbing amber together and he noticed that when he rubbed the amber together that there was a, a magnetic type effect. Same type of thing if you wear certain types of clothes you can get static electricity. Um, but it starts, it starts with the rubbing of amber. It was also shown for some iron based alloys magnetite as well which is Fe304. Um, Continuing on with the history around 1200 AD when uh, shipbuilding and, and people were doing voyages for exploration, the use of magnetic compasses was reported both in China and England. So they were seeing while they were going through certain areas that uh, electromagnetic, electromagnetic effects were occurring in the compasses um, you know, as they were on their voyage. Um, in around 1600 AD, somebody named William Gilbert published his treatise on about 12 years worth of research he did on magnetism uh, called De Magnete. Um, but it wasn't until about 1830s with Michael Faraday where the electromagnetic induction techniques really started to drive the technology. So in 1831, Faraday discovered the electromagnetic induction. And then 1864, James Clerk Maxwell built upon what Faraday did, and he wrote his treatise on electricity and magnetism. So if you out in the Great Lawn here and you look up at the buildings, you'll see all the names that are written on, on the tops of the, the walls here. So you'll see Maxwell, you'll see Faraday. So a, just a brief discussion on Faraday's laws and Maxwell's equations. So these, is, these equations, there's basically four equations that guide electro, electricity and magnetism. So the first is Gauss's law. So it's the gradient of the electric permittivity times the electric field will result in electric charge density. Um, and then you also have a Gauss's law for magnetism. So this is your Gauss's law for electricity. This is your Gauss's law for magnetism. And it's the gradient of the magnetic permeability times the magnetic field will equal zero. So these are, these are known boundary conditions that will then dictate it's a it's electricity and magnetism, it's a hand-in-hand -hand, uh, phenomenon. Faraday's law is the cross product of the gradient times the electric field, and it's the partial derivative of the magnetic permeability times the magnetizing field with respect to time. So this is how you take it from a boundary condition equation to being able to 
get values with respect to over a certain amount of time. Ampere's law is the gradient um, times the magnetizing field, and it's going to equal this electric current density plus a partial derivative factor here, which takes into account your electric permittivity, the electric field, and the d differential with respect to time. If you do some additional math, you can then put this equation in the form of a boundary condition, which is your charge conservation, which is the electric charge, the gradient of the electric charge density plus the partial derivative of the electric charge density with respect to time. So using these four equations and setting boundary conditions with respect to either use of electric current or use of magnetic field will lead you to two additional equations that are then can be inputs into the equipment that are doing the non-destructive testing. And these are going to be the magnetic field equals the magnetic permeability times the magnetizing field. And then the other one, which is Ohm's law, which if you've ever taken a class on circuits, um, you'll sometimes see it written differently. Um, sometimes it's voltage equals current times resistance. But for our purposes here, we keep it in differential form just so you can see where it's built off the four Maxwell's equations. And then that is going to be um, your electric current density is the electric charge density times the velocity, which equals your electrical conductivity times the electric field. And then this one is going to be a guiding uh, equation for electromagnetic testing that we see in practice in industry. So when you have current, whether it's a copper wire or some other, uh, in certain cases, you cannot use platinum or something that's a very good conductor, you, you will know the electric conductivity from experimental tests that have been performed 100 years ago. So that's already something that you can go look up in a table. You know you can, you can control the electric field based on whether you give it a specific magnetic field or just knowing the material properties of the component you're both using to do the inspection and the material that's under the test. So to tie these equations in with the electromagnetic phenomenon, um, before Maxwell published his equations, there was an ind individual called Orsted, and he discovered the electric current's magnetic effect. So what happened, he was doing experiments on a compass with a, um, a rod, basically, a cylindrical rod, and he noticed that when he closed an electric circuit, that there would be a, a both electric and ma magnetic effect that occurred between the compass and the copper rod. Um, if you take in high school physics, high school robotics classes now, you probably came across the right hand rule for circuits. So this is basically tying into that. Um, following up on Faraday's discovery was another individual called Heinrich Lenz. And if you're an EECS student, you've probably heard of what's called lens forces. That's where the term lens forces came about from Heinrich Lenz. So you have lens forces and Lorenz forces dealing with your electromotive um, induction. Uh, in 1879, David Hughes performed the first recorded eddy current test. Um, and then following up when World War I and World War II started, they actually went and did more research into the techniques for military purposes. So in 1946, the first practical system for measuring the flux leakage, um, so that would be the magnetic flux leakage of, of your magnetic field, was done by Hastings. And what he found was that for both surface and subsurface, but we're not going to talk about subsurface as we did with ultrasonics. This will be near subsurface. So within maybe one or two centimeters of the surface. That's as, that's as far as the eddy current system can penetrate before the field will wear off. So for surface and near surface discontinuities, um, on, he was looking at bore surfaces on steel tubes. The research was done on that 
um, for inspection purposes. And following up on that to present day was in the 50s, Forrester uh, developed impedance plane signal displays. And that ties into what I showed you in the first lecture where there were the Lisa Ju signals and you basically had a XY graph. And as you move the eddy current probe over the component, you will see a electrical movement on the XY graph. All right, to put it in schematic form, what you have is this is your eddy current sensor. So whether it's ultrasonics, eddy currents, we, I showed you some photos of the probes that are used. So this eddy current sensor, just think of that as the transducer uh, probe that goes over the sample. Um, in this particular instance, it's a coil system, and that is, that is usually shown because the sample here is flat. Um, if it, you are doing heat exchanger inspections, it's no longer has this architecture. They have different architecture for when they put the coils within heat exchanger tubes. Um, and that's for mostly nuclear inspections for heat exchangers. But what it does is the, it induces the magnetic field. And if there is a discontinuity or indication on the sample, rather than it being a uniform electric field, there will be some deviation. So sometimes you'll hear in industry, um, pancake samples is some of the terms used for some of the coils. But what happens is it's, you have both electricity and magnetism, they go hand in hand. If there is a discontinuity, so if we were talking about um, aerospace disks or forgings, if there was that hard alpha inclusion, what would happen is there will, that will induce different, um, a different response to the system. There's pros and cons for electromagnetic testing, and it's also, you'll also see it sometimes referred to as eddy current inspection. So um, in, in industry, it's sometimes known as ET or ECI. Um, it may really, is, that's just a preference on the inspector but it can be used on both ferromagnetic and non-magnetic materials, which is a benefit over magnetic particle inspection. So one of the things though, it, it's typically not used on polymeric materials. Unless it was a polymeric material that you somehow doped with um, something that would make it electronic uh, at the microstructural level. Typically for macrostructure inspections, it is only, um, ferromagnetic. It can be done on non-magnetic, but typically not polymeric. Um, it's used for discontinuity detection as well as for thickness. So if you're riding over, uh, you know, any number of bridges that we have in the states here, sometimes you'll see the, they send inspectors out to determine wall loss. So they determine wall loss um, using eddy current techniques. And when there's corrosion, what happens is they will prep the surface and remove any type of exfoliation or rust, go to a uh, bare surface that is lustrous or the base metal, and then they can do the eddy current test to give you remaining wall thickness. And that determines if a structural member needs to be repaired, if it can uh, remain in service, and it also gives guidelines to inspectors on timetables for subsequent inspections based on percent wall loss. So you'll see that happens a lot for bridge inspections, for decking, for other types of structural components. Um, for aerospace, one of the other applications is if you have the wings, they can also use eddy currents to detect wall thickness underneath superficial corrosion. Um, or if there's a coating, so if you're doing oil, gas, petrochemical type uh, inspections, they can use uh, eddy currents for coating thicknesses. So sometimes they'll put a flame retardant coating on the material. You can, if the flame retardant coating is thin enough, you can actually send the eddy currents through the coating to detect the base metal underneath. So that's where that ties into surface and near surface inspection. So for the coating thickness over a substrate, 
that's actually very useful and it saves a lot of time and it also saves money. If it's critical petrochemical industry, they don't want to have to remove the, uh, whether it's a corrosion protective surface or whether it's flame retardant surface. They don't want to have to scrape that off because the bond, to get the bond back on, they need to rough up the base metal. So it actually is a way to do it non-destructively and not have to remove the coating. One of the issues with the technique is that the sensitivity to the variables of the test can be a liability. So there is quite a bit of um, variability with respect to the material that you're evaluating and the thicknesses and geometries. So this leads back to what we had talked previously on false positive indications and sensitivity signal to noise. That is one of the issues where if you need to have that 90, 95 probability of detection confidence level, you, for critical applications, you, design, you can design eddy current probes around what you're looking at, but there, it's known that the variability based on material properties can be an issue with this technique. So for traditional eddy current inspections, it's highly sensitive to the shape, all right? And there's also testing conditions, whether you're planning on doing this outside in an ambient environment or whether the inspection can be done in a clean room or some other type of uh, controlled humidity temperature environment, that will actually have an effect on the output from the eddy current sensors. So that needs to be something that you understand before you do the inspection so you're not looking at the output and making a go, no go call on something without all the information. Um, specimen factors that are taken into account are the electrical conductivity. And that ties into what's known as the liftoff distance. So when, uh, if you had an aerospace component that had a leading edge or trailing edge that had some taper or shape geometrical curvature to it, you can have liftoff is an extremely critical variable to the inspection. So rather than the schematic I showed you earlier where it's a flat plate, generally in the real world, you don't have homogeneous samples. The samples are, have torturous geometries. They have internal pouring, pores or cooling channels, things like that. So you need to understand that there is what's called liftoff um, as you're going over that geometry. So the, the eddy currents induced will vary if you're going over a taper. If there's discontinuities in the sample, um, permeability of the material that you're testing. So the magnetic permeability is a material property and it's going to differ whether you're looking at aluminum alloys or whether you're looking at a nickel based super alloy or whether you're just looking at copper or steel. So that's a material property. Um, the thickness of the sample also makes a difference, as well as if we're talking about the heat exchangers where it's a cylindrical rod that they're putting the eddy. The eddy current probe is actually on a cylindrical rod that goes into the tube. It, that, the number of turns and windings on that probe can affect the output, and that's for heat exchangers. So on, at nuclear power plant sites, they have thousands and thousands of these heat exchanger tubes. And it's, that is the quickest and most cost effective way for them to determine if any of those tubes either need to be plugged or need a sleeve over them. Because if the heat exchanger has a through wall hole in it, then you'll get uh, chlorides either from the river water or wherever the, that water for the cooling at the power plant comes in what's gonna happen is if they get a through wall hole, they're gonna to have to remove that whole heat exchanger and replace it. So that's downtime at the plant. Rule of thumb that I was told is for um, a nuclear power plant for a unit, if it's down one day, it's probably about $1 million loss a day. So this cut ties into preventative maintenance. You don't wanna have through wall holes. So if you know you can plug the heat exchanger tube this is very valuable to the owners, operators of those sites. With respect to sensitivity, the technique is approximately as sensitive as liquid penetrant inspection and magnetic particle inspection, which we haven't discussed yet. 
The benefit of it is it takes much less time to do. So with liquid penetrant inspection, you have, you, that relies on capillary action and you have to do surface prep and it takes about 30 minutes to do a single test. Here you can just run the eddy current probe in and out of the tube in a matter of seconds. So there's a factor of thousand uh, benefit with respect to how quickly you can do the inspection. As I said before, there's a lot of inspection variables that can affect the sensitivity reliability of the test. Um, these tie into just the fact that there's, these parameters change at, over time with the sample. So if the sample's affected by corrosion over time, these values, you'll see a differential if you go and take a test and then go take a test at a later point in time. So the coil impedance, the uh, liftoff different distance can change. Um, edge effects and skin effects we're going to talk about in subsequent slides. But one of the other ones um, that is we're going to talk about in this, uh, this lecture is the design of the inspection coils. So that takes into account the size, the shape, and the number of windings. And in general, that just all encompass under this umbrella term, the architecture of the sensor that you use. So you can actually design different sensors, eddy current sensors, and it can have multiple channels and multiple probes within that same architecture. So that way you can actually get multiple uh, inspection opportunities with a single transducer. So that will be something we talk about in, in some of the subsequent slides. The, in, the quality of the eddy current inspection is ultimately only as good as the calibration technique that's performed prior to the inspection. So it, you have to uh, calibrate the equipment you're using against a known reference standard. That known reference standard specific to the material alloy. So if you're using aluminum alloys, the reference standard will not be the same as if you're using um, nickel, nickel alloy or titanium alloy. Um, one of the couple of the um, committees or, or standard places that are relevant for this is ASTM, which is American Society of Testing and Materials. So you can actually get a specification for eddy current testing of aerospace wing components, things like that. It will be in that much detail. Um, also, one of the things to know is since generally copper is a very good conductor and it's used as the standard against other materials, there's something known as the International Annealed Copper Standards. So if you go in, look up reference books on eddy current testing, you'll see it. Um, the tables say as a percentage of IACS. So it's compared against copper, um, depending on what material you're testing. As I said before, it's going to be specific to the thickness, the material under inspection, as well as the target flaw size that you're trying to detect. So if there are limits to detection using this, but eddy current is a is fairly sensitive technique and you can get down to micron size flaws if the sensors built properly. So one of the things we're going to see here, all right, this is a uh, commercially available off-the-shelf unit. Um, as I said before, what I showed you in the first lecture uh, was a single point probe, single channel. And that was where the individual was running the point probe over the aerospace component. And there was the video where you saw the Lisa Juice signals on the, on the readout. What you're seeing here is what's known as a C-scan. So that is where they actually have multiple channels simultaneously performing these operations. All right. One of the things, this, is, this was on those flat bottom hole samples. So we're talking one, that's divisions of 1 64th of an inch. So number one flat bottom hole is 1 64th an inch diameter. Number two flat bottom hole is 2 64ths and so on. So what you can see here is with 32 channel probe that scans over and it and this is your B scan data here. This is your A scan data here. And this is the C scan output when it takes all those 32 channels. 
All right, this is what I'm talking about, resolution of the output. So you need to have somebody who's been doing this for years to say, well, is that really a flaw or not? And this is where it comes in where you can get false positive indications. So for this particular sample, you can see that that number one flat bottom hole, uh, it's, it is somewhat below the detection limit of that system that was used. Because an inspector it would be hard pressed to say with 95% confidence whether this is a flaw or not. But you can start to see the appearance of a differential with respect to the um, electrical properties. So some options you could do is use this as a screening procedure to go over a large area and then do a follow-up and just concentrate on this area and see if you can refine the scan. So there's some ways to try to limit the false positive detections. One of the things to keep into account is since it's near surface, um, surface technique and near surface, you have what's known as skin effect. And this is as your, as your attempt to go deeper into the thickness of the sample, it's, it's, the depth of penetration is falling off one over the square root and you have V as your test frequency in hertz, whether it's kilohertz, megahertz. All right, this is your electrical conductivity. And it's also a product of, like I said before, the percent IACS of the material under, uh, under test. Um, mu sub naught is the permittivity of free space. So this is your, this is too much math than I don't really need to go into, but mu sub naught is also you're comparing mu sub naught. Mu sub naught's the reference, right? So when you're looking at mu in these equations, that's versus mu sub naught, all right? So the permittivity of free space in air is set as the standard for mu naught. Um, depth of penetration is higher at lower frequencies, but the sensitivity decreases. So it, the reverse is also true. The higher the frequency, all right, you can get less depth of penetration. So it, you won't actually go, it will be truly surface technique at a higher frequency. But you, it's a trade-off between if you are doing a surface or near surface technique versus how great a sensitivity you need. So if you altered the frequency on that previous slide, you might be able to improve that quality of the output on the C-scan. Um, this is a, a schematic that I think shows it well. All right, you have various coils, and what's happening here is that this 37% of surface density, this is where it falls off as one over the square root. So that 37% is based on the, the skin, the skin uh, depth equation. All right, higher frequency, higher conductivity, high permeativity, that shows that these eddy currents are more focused towards the surface, all right, versus if you are trying to do something with a little more depth of penetration that looks for flaws near surface, not, not truly surface, but near surface flaws. In addition to skin effects, there's what's known as edge effects. Edge effects is something that you can't get around when you're doing the inspection because if there are sharp edges, you will not have that. That's where the, the eddy currents, when they meet the edge, that's where it becomes difficult if you have a flaw right near that edge because if we're talking about a welded structure, those edge areas are typically the most highly stressed, all right? So if you're trying to make a decision on if there's a flaw at the edge, there's a higher chance that it could be a false positive because the eddy currents get distorted when it meets that edge rather than them just being able to flow freely. All right, as I said before, the percent IACS conductivity um, varies based on the material that we're testing. So you can see that there's, there is this 
a couple orders of magnitude range depending on the material. So wasp alloy, hast alloy, um, those are alloyed materials. So the more, al the more highly alloyed the material, if it's a nickel-based super alloy, it can have eight to 10 uh, trace elements added in to get those mechanical properties. This ties into the noise of the microstructure. So titanium alloys are highly noisy, aluminum alloys have noise, and the alloying uh, affects that percent conductivity. So in the ultrasonic lecture, we said it's how the acoustic waves scatter through the material. You can take a similar approach here, only it's how the uh, electric or magnetic waves scatter through the material. That image earlier with the 32 channels, that would be considered a multi-frequency technique. So rather than a single point probe that only gives you a single piece of data for one location at one point in time, you can use multi-frequency techniques this ties into what I discussed about the heat exchanger tubing earlier. So they use multiple channeled uh, transducers and they run them in the length. So the other thing to note for steam generators, these are, we're talking, they can put these in 100 feet, maybe longer. So that's the order of magnitude we're talking distance wise. And they just run the coil, they run the coil that whole distance and then they bring it back. So they get two opportunities to see if there's any Lisa juice signals or wall loss. As they put the probe in, they'll get that first scan and they'll see what's you know, on their readout. And then when they get the back wall of transducer, they'll pull the, the coil out and then they can see if at the same spot they saw going in, it's coming out, that's an area where they can follow up for potential wall loss or corrosion in the, the tubes. Um, same other things, as I said before, this relates to the water chemistry in the environment at the site. So if, if you want to use, for example, the Hudson River, it's known that it has brackish river water, which is high in chlorides. So the high um, you know, PPMs and chlorides affect the rate of corrosion for if you're using a copper nickel or if you're going to be using an admiralty brass or some other type of bronze, that has a big effect, the, the intake water. The flaw depth or percent wall loss is displayed, as I showed in the uh, first lecture, as the Lisa juice signals um, for a differential coil arrangement. So one other thing, uh, one other equation would be for so for the the depth of penetration of those eddy currents that's known as the percent IACS at the surface minus the percent IACS at the edge divided by the percent IACS at the surface minus the percent IACS at the potential discontinuity or flaw that you're looking at. So I just put that in as flaw. So you can think of it if any of you are course three lever rule. So it's the, it's the totality over the entire distance versus the actual area that you're interrogating at the moment. All right, so, but it's based on that percent IACS at each depth. So the output from that single channel, single frequency probe, this will give you an idea on how um, non-technical uh, and non-advanced the NDT techniques have been up to about the 1980s. These are what's known as strip charts, and they're basically just printed out charts. 
So it wasn't even uh, on a, a, it wasn't even a graphical user interface printout until about the 90s. They still had printout readout charts. So as they would do the inspection, it would be like if you're at the supermarket and, and putting in somebody's uh, receipt, it, the strip chart just keeps pushing out. And then you have to go back and then try to look at the strip chart and remember versus where you were inspecting at that moment in time. So that's how unadvanced the eddy current testing was until about 35, 40 years ago. This is an example of the strip chart. So this is what would be essentially your A scan data, which is the raw data of the eddy current signal. And then this, if you look, is the Lisa juice signals. So this is, can be your B scan data and the, how wide the Lisa juice signal is or how narrow it is is how the inspector makes a decision on percentage flaw loss. Since the 80s, uh, with the advancement of computing technology, the technology's come quite a, quite a way. Um, some of that started at MIT in the laboratory for electromagnetic and electronic systems over near um, the Hayden Li uh, Barker Library in Building 13. There was a professor, James Melcher, um, who had doctorate students doing research on both uh, magnetic permeability and electrical permeability. So a lot of the research started here back in the 80s. Uh, and what, what happened is it improved the reliability, sensitivity, and repeatability even further compared to penetrant inspections and magnetic particle inspections. So one of the issues with a magnetic particle inspection is you need to not only magnetize the sample which, with what's known as a yoke, but if it's something that needs to be demagnetized, you have to also demagnetize the sample after the test. Otherwise, if you leave a remnant magnetic field, if it's going up in air, it will affect the controls of the system you're potentially using. So that, that's one of the things that's important uh, and, and an advantage of eddy current techniques. Um, so simultaneous data collection at each sensing element. I had talked before about a 32 channel array. The arrays can be much more than 32 channels, but it's important to know that at each element in the array, it is collecting the information on these equations simultaneously. So the more channels that you can run over the sample, it gives you with respect to statistics, you can, you can average all of those channels to improve the sensitivity. Um, and that, that ties into signal to noise and the resolution of the image. So the technique we'll discuss, um, this is actually a company that was a spin-off from the uh, laboratory for electromagnetic electronic systems. This was based on um, uh, Dr. Goldfein's thesis. He turned it into a company that is still based in Massachusetts and they do inspections on various components, structural components. And what I was referring to earlier was you have many sensing elements. This right here is a flexible conformable sensor. This is the sensor architecture. So if you would zoom in on that, you have what's known as MWM stands for meandering winding magnetometer. So the meandering has, uh, deals with the fact that the, the probe actually winds back and forth, all right? But you can alter the geometry of the sensing elements and you can actually cater that to the material under inspection. So the architecture for this, um, if you were looking at a turbine blade, the architecture for the sensing element is not the same as if you were looking at some other type of disc material or thicker structural material. Um, ultimately, what this enables the inspector and the owner operator to get is what's known as mapping and tracking. So if you go in and do an inspection and then you go back in and do that same inspection at a later point in time, you have the differential between the two inspections and then you can actually compare that versus how many cycles. So for aerospace components where fatigue is a, is a critical uh, mode of failure because of the pressurization, depressurization cycles 
of both the fuselage and the wing components. What happens is you can go in, if you know the location you did the inspection, you go do it with the same, at the same frequency, um, with you know, just making sure that the, the surface prep is as close as possible. And then you can show that after X amount of cycles, uh, you know, if there is some type of indication, is it growing or is it, uh, has it not propagated? This has important implications to um, how long you can keep it in service or if a decision's made to swap a component out and replace it. Um, the way the technique works uh, is they, they've already done these calculations for various materials that they've tested and, and the, what's known as a pre-computed grid structure. So as long as the sensor that they're using falls within this grid space, then that is essentially how they self-calibrate the, their system. If they do a test and this area falls outside of the pre-computed grid, there's either an issue with the material thickness, there's either an issue with the expected IACS, but that is a, uh, that's a self-check for them that it, the data output may not be accurate if it doesn't fall within those pre-computed grid spaces. So the difference from the previous slide, this is the same sample, all right? So where you saw that pixelation of those flat bottom holes, this is after, this is with, with just the raw data without doing any follow-up optimization of the scan. So what you see here is you actually can get much better resolution on where those flat bottom holes are. You can also get information with respect to the sizing of them uh, to a much greater sensitivity than you can get with some other techniques. Um, there are what's known as artifacts uh, as a result of the scan process. So with having all of those channels, sometimes you drop a channel, sometimes, uh, and if you normalize and, you, and you've dropped the channel, you can get striping effects or other types of noise in the image. So uh, understanding what the C-scan output should look like can give you some indications on if you've done the inspection correctly. It's a way to self-calibrate, and it's also a way to be somewhat of a sanity check. Um, if, if you know the sample's flat, you wouldn't expect to see large conductivity differences unless there was some type of um, heat-affected zone or microstructural effect from processing. So, that allows you to improve that signal to noise ratio. And it, um, what the term is, is called discrimination threshold. So on that previous slide, where they set the lower and upper boundaries for percent IACS, that will be specific to the material that's inspected. And it's also specific to the geometry and individual properties of that material under test. So that is something an operator sets. They set upper bound, lower bound. It's not different from an ultrasonic inspection where an inspector sets a threshold gate. They call it a gate in ultrasonics. For this particular technique, they call it discrimination threshold. It's essentially, it's dealing with that signal to noise ratio to try to, try to get the signal as high as possible and the background noise as low as possible. Um, but as I said before, there's artifacts in the image. So one of the things, having multiple channels simultaneously collecting data, you can then go in and look at each individual channel and then to see if the response is approximately the same. So what you're seeing, this is the B scan data, and what you're seeing is that these channels all seem to be operating properly. So it's also a way to check and see if the sensor itself has undergone any damage because sometimes if you do multiple inspections, the sensors are bait, have, have like a mylar shim or there's some type of shim they use. Um, and if the sensor got roughed up or some, something happened in service, you could actually see that based on the A and B scan data. That's as opposed to the strip chart data where there is no way to go back in. You just have to look at the printout 
and you'd have to make a judgment on if the data was accurate or not. So along with what I previously said, it's a way to go into looking at the A scan, the raw data, and for the sizing of the discontinuity, sometimes this, the size of the discontinuity or flaw is the critical parameter of interest. So if you can't have something that's greater than two thousandths of an inch, you can actually go in and you can approximately size what you're seeing on the data. This you can't do with other techniques, so there's, this is actually a way that this technique provides additional value to the user. One of the things I want to point out on, on this image here is the rate at which you scan that sample will affect the output. So this is where that velocity term that, was, that I erased off the board before, the velocity deals with the velocity of how quickly you go over the sample. And what you're seeing in this image is those flat bottom holes are uh, circular under these, under these three areas. But what happens is due to the speed of the speed of moving over the sample, they appear as elliptical. So this was something that you have to take into account. You have to actually, depending on how, depending on if it's just, if you detect it or don't de detect it, that's that A versus A hat. Or if you're trying to size the flaw, then this is important. The velocity is important depending on if you just need to detect it or if you need to try to size it. And that will be industry specific, and that'll be for mission specific for if it's going out to space or if it's just going to be something that has a, not as much of a high value component. Um, one of the things I wanted to show were friction stir welding, which is uh, known as a, the latest and greatest welding technique. It basically deals with using an anvil and actually uh, the friction causes heat and it actually, the friction is what causes the weld in the component. So what you're seeing here is this is the, this is where the friction stir weld is. So you can do an inspection on these and, and you can do it for heat affected zone, you can do it for residual compressive stresses. So there's also value um, uh, from a design point of view that you can do these because friction stir welding in industry um, for auto automotive they going to use friction stir welding more these are aluminum alloys um, I think they're either 2000 or 3000 series aluminum alloys but what you can see here is if they didn't have the geometry of the friction stir welded anvil correctly you can get lack of penetration you could get at a microstructural level flaws in the weld and by doing this type of inspection technique, you can see if the percent IACS will give you a clue on if the inspection was, uh, or if the manufacturer of the component was proper or not. So um, what you're seeing here is you have two sides, right? You have a root side of the weld. Uh, the root of the weld is at the base, the crown of the weld's at the tip. So you actually can do the scan from either, either side and you will get different outputs. And this goes towards the um, residual stresses from the welding technique itself. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is that you can actually even see the, the marking for which sample. That's how sensitive the technique is. And that was just done with uh, like a box cutter or scribe, something like that. So very, very sensitive to sur surface superficial imperfections. So that's all I had for today. Um, I'll be doing the lecture tomorrow as well. The last thing I did want to include was one limitation. Um, this is aluminum foam. This is known as open cell aluminum foam and closed cell aluminum foam. Uh, it, you would not be appropriate to do eddy current technique on this because of the porosity built into the sand casting technique. All right, so you, th this is known as a lost wax investment wax casting, and the roughness on the surface would preclude you from doing eddy current. So you have to know 
that there are limitations to the techniques. You can't use it for every material. Thank you.